Memphis, Tennessee. You probably already have an opinion about it. You've heard it's really dangerous and Elvis lived here and they have really good barbecue. All of that is true. I like Memphis. I don't love Memphis, but I don't think Memphis really cares what I think. I had a chance to stop here while on a road trip and I was like, let's give Memphis another shot. I was lucky. The late November day was full of abundant sunshine. So I took one of the big bridges over the mighty Mississippi and spent a day in the second biggest city in the state. It was the perfect evening to eat some barbecue, take in some good music, and do a short tour of Memphis, Tennessee, everyone! Downtown Memphis. It isn't outrageous or anything. This isn't where you're gonna see all the rundown buildings and all the graffiti and all the gangs and the crime and the potholes. Those are bad parts of town that I showed in another video and they are bad, 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 mister. Instead, we're gonna drive around downtown Memphis starting on the south end town and see what this city's all about. And along the way, we'll meet a former Memphis police officer who has some pretty interesting things to say about the way his city's headed it was a very honest and thought-provoking conversation. Of course, you probably know the city of Memphis has a lot of history and culture. This was home to a lot of the civil rights movements that took place last century. Sadly, this was the site of Martin Luther King Jr.'s 1968 assassination. It's also one of the places where blues music really took hold, and music is a big part of the city's culture. We'll see Beale Street in a bit. It's world famous for its clubs that have been playing music for a century now. You knew Elvis lived here and his former home in Graceland's in Memphis. Sadly, Graceland is surrounded by a ghetto. Other famous musicians from Memphis include Johnny Cash, B.B. King, Al Green, Aretha Franklin, and even Justin Timberlake. He is now an actor. BBQ is a big deal here, and Memphis hosts the annual World Championship BBQ Cooking Contest, which brings in 100,000 people every year. Downtown has an arena that's home to the NBA team, the Memphis Grizzlies, also in downtown is the University of Memphis. It's a very religious city. A lot of the economy here was based on cotton and lumber for a long time. Today, Memphis is a manufacturing and logistics center. FedEx uses the Memphis airport as its biggest hub. Half of all FedEx volume passes through Memphis, as does 70% of all U.S. mail. There's also a big port along the Mississippi River, which handles a lot of shipping too. It's relatively cheap to live here, but there's a reason it's so cheap. A lot of the cities run down and about 30% of the population lives in poverty. The population here is about 650,000 people, but it peaked 20 years ago. It's now on a slow decline, despite the fact that Tennessee is bringing in huge numbers of new residents. At one point, Memphis was growing faster than nearby Nashville, but it seems like everyone's heading to Nashville these days. While Memphis has great food, great music, and a lot of energy, the crime here is off the chain. Memphis continues to break records for murders, and there's no sign it's going to let up. There's years when Memphis is considered the most dangerous city in the nation, up there with St. Louis and Detroit. If you looked at a map of where to live in Memphis, you'd see there aren't a lot of great areas outside of the east side of the city. The west side on the other side of the river is Arkansas, and that's West Memphis. It's bad over there, fella. South Memphis is riddled with crime and poverty, as are large pockets on the north end. Most of the safer, nicer parts of the greater Memphis area are on its east side. So if you moved here, that's where you'd want to look first. Collierville is the fancy part of town. There's crime in just about every pocket of this city. It's not because there's a murder here every single day. Just about everyone in Memphis has been robbed at some point, or will be robbed at some point if they haven't already. The schools are behind and there's a lot of drug use here and a lot of gangs. We'll talk about that in a bit. But Memphis used to be artsy-fartsy. Now it's gunsy, knivesy. Some people say that Memphis leaders have given up, that Memphis is too broken to fix. Others are more hopeful. If Memphis can get revitalized and cleaned up and maintained, it would be a great place to live. It has some incredible restaurants and a decent nightlife, some friendly people and a great zoo. And there's a certain magic on Beale Street with its gritty, bluesy vibe. Speaking of which, while in downtown Memphis, I went out for an evening of barbecue and music on Beale Street. This is where all the music venues and great restaurants are located. It's actually not that big, just a couple blocks long. It was pretty dead, actually. But that didn't mean I didn't have fun. Come on now. 
Of course, as always, I forgot to take a picture of my barbecue before it was packed away. The music was pretty good. You can bounce around from venue to venue and see different styles of music. Some bands are more energetic than others. The next morning, I checked out the Mississippi from my hotel room and then walked down to the famous Peabody Hotel to see the Daily Duck March. These ducks come down from their room every morning and walk through the lobby and jump into the hotel fountain. It's pretty cute. <laughs> but back to downtown again. I sat down on a call with Mike, a retired police officer here, who served as the president of the Memphis Police Officers Union. Mike's been here his whole life and even ran for mayor once. Here's that conversation. You know, Mike, you're a former Memphis Police Union president. I know you grew up in Memphis. Um, I think yes. you still love your community, right? Love my community too much mm -hmm. sometimes, I feel. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I want to talk a little bit about Memphis. I know there's a there's a, a bad side of Memphis everybody knows about that I've talked about before, but I kind of want to just talk about Memphis in general. Um, you know, the, the good and the bad. And, and you you probably know Memphis better than anybody else um, in Memphis. Um, can you give people an idea out there, just a general idea? What's Memphis like? Well, Memphis is a beautiful city. Uh, Memphis sits on the Mississippi Bluff. It's the gateway to the west. You have two bridges in the city of Memphis. We're still one of the only cities that uh, this size that owns its own major utility. We produce our own natural gas. We are a transportation hub with FedEx, UPS, DHL, all of those uh, transporters being located here in the city of Memphis. We have our own football team. Well, not football. We have our own, own pro basketball team, which is the Memphis Grizzlies. We're famous for world famous Bill Street, um, you know, uh, home of the blues, uh, barbecue. What I like about Memphis is you get a lot of bang for your buck as well. Uh, a lot of individuals are re retiring from up north or out in California, out west, and they come back here because their dollar goes a lot further. I also love Memphis because it has trees, beautiful trees, uh, lakes and ponds. and uh, You have the ability to, uh, you know, give me 50 feet. You got space. Everything's not uh, all on top of each other. It's not as congested. I've lived in Boston, Washington, D.C., um, uh, Maryland, you know, the East Coast, Upper East Coast. And I've been to Chicago, been all over because I'm a retired uh, uh, Army warrant officer as well. So I've been all over the world. But this is the place that I chose to come back to uh, because uh, I love the hospitality, you know. With all of the bad and the ills and the woes that are going on in the city, it still has a lot of wonderful qualities. Yeah. Now, for fun, what what what's there to do for fun in Memphis? Um, I, I've been to Beale Street. I've seen some of the, the the music stuff going on. I've tasted your awesome food. What about for 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 families that are looking to move there? What kind of stuff would they want to do for fun? Well, I'm saying it's according to what you like to do. You know. Uh, you can go four-wheeling. Uh, you can go horseback riding. Uh, there are plenty of parks and uh, lakes and ponds if you're an outdoorsy kind of person uh, to be able to do that. You can go to the football games. You can go. Uh, we have museums, the Brooks Museum, the um, uh, National uh, Civil Rights Museum here in the city of Memphis as well. Uh, you got, uh, if you like go-karting and you know, just about anything you can do anywhere else, you can probably find it here in Memphis as well. Uh, some of the, you know, no, we don't have subways and, uh, you know, the mass transit system is not up to speed like New York or Chicago or something like that. But, um, you know, transportation is still not really a major problem for those. you got Uber and all of that kind of stuff if, if you just need to get around. Uh, we don't have a lot of taxis here in the city of Memphis. And what other thing good about Memphis is it's not, it's kind of centrally located. So if you're trying to get to Atlanta, if you're trying to get to Chicago, if you're trying to get to St. Louis or 
Nashville and different places like that. It only takes you anywhere from five to seven hours to be able to do that. So uh, there are a lot of things to do. Yeah. What's the culture like there? I know it's very religious. I know that uh, it's, ba- you know, music and food. Um, what else? Uh, how would you how else would you describe Memphis's culture? Well, I, I would describe Memphis as uh, a big little town <laughs> uh, because uh, we have a population of about uh, 650,000. And but it still has that small town feel because everything is so spread out. Uh, Memphis is 240 square miles. That's the same size as the state of or, or the city of New York. Uh, whereas they may have 12 million people, we only have 650,000 people. And you don't have the tall skyscrapers like you have up there. But here you have everything that's uh, spread out all over those uh, 240 square miles. Um, I would describe Memphis as kind of a lazy town. Um, you know, they roll the carpets up late at night, other than downtown, uh, Overton Square, and some unique places that individuals know about. Um, you're not going to see a whole lot of activity here in the city of Memphis. Uh, or it doesn't seem as though there's a lot of activity, but there is. Uh, and that's because everything is not necessarily on top of each other, like in a in a Chicago or Houston or San Antonio or something like that. So, um, and, and for me, sometimes that that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. How would you, how would you describe the people of Memphis? What are they like um, in general? Uh, Southern hospitality friendly. I, 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 I get that vibe when I'm there. I'll say for the most part, uh, the citizens are, are, are good people here in the city of Memphis. I think that, they, um, uh, like you talked about religion, a lot of people are religious here. It's like part of the Bible Belt. Um, I think they're very hospitable. Um, I think that, you know, if in fact you go into restaurants or you go into a lot of places, you're going to be received with open arms. Uh, and I think the city of Memphis embraces people uh, that come from out of town. Um, a lot of people come here for Elvis. Uh, you know, Elvis's mansion is here, and then they got Elvis Presley Enterprise uh, out off of um, out there off of Elvis Presley Boulevard. And uh, I never hear of any problems, believe it or not, with the tourists that come in uh, to see Elvis, uh, other than they may have a car break in or something like that every now and then, but nothing really major. So uh, I think that people for the most part, are hardworking, decent individuals that are trying to uh, enjoy going into their twilight. Where are the good and bad parts of town, uh, northeast, southwest, if you were going to try to pinpoint that on a map? Well, I'm going I'm to tell you that uh, when they broke up, Claiborne Homes, Fowler Homes, uh, Central Garden, not Central Gardens, uh, Lamoan Gardens, they broke up Dixie Home, they broke up um, Scudderfield, which is in North Memphis. It kind of decentralized where the bad areas are. Uh, you can be in some of the most affluent areas here in the city of Memphis now and become a victim of crime. Uh, that used to be unheard of, but because they decentralized uh, a lot of the housing projects, and they started Section 8 in a lot of the houses out in the uh, rural areas or the outskirts of downtown because all of the major projects, believe it or not, were centered around downtown. But that was uh, soon to be found out as valuable property. So uh, they tore the projects down, renovated those areas, but then they decentralized all of the individuals that were relegated to those specific areas. So now you can go out to Cordova or Germantown or Bartlett or uh, any other area in town and you're going to have some issues and problems. Well, there could be issues and problems if you're not aware of your surroundings and you're not paying attention to uh, what's going on. Um, South yeah. Memphis, I think you showed that in your last video. Uh, I did watch. Uh, you know, in some areas, uh, 
I think there's one area that was labeled as one of the most dangerous areas, neighborhoods in the United States. Um, and it could be that, you know, um, just like in any city, you definitely don't want to go to the wrong places. And then when you talk about uh, North Memphis, uh, that could be a little sketchy. Uh, Raleigh Fraser areas, uh, those could be a little sketchy. When you go out to uh, Westwood Whitehaven, that could be a little sketchy. Uh, but like I said, what used to be like Cordova or Hickory Hill or something uh, that individuals know about, those used to be the affluent areas in the city of Memphis, uh, but those have <clears throat> also became areas that uh, that you just got to be careful in. So uh, all over the city of Memphis, you just got to be really careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like, you know, you're a former police officer. You ran for mayor once. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know that you it, it sounds like you say that you're tired of living in fear though, because of the crime in Memphis. Um, and I think, are you, are you going to stick around? Are you trying to get into the, like the Mississippi suburbs to kind of get away from the crime? That's kind of emerging. This, this, this is my home. I'm probably going to die and be buried or burnt up here in the city of Memphis. If I decide to be cremated, uh, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, I'm a 21 year veteran from the United States army. I'm not going to let anybody run me out. Um, I am relegated to, in whatever ways that I can, to help fix the problems. Uh, there are a lot of problems here in the city of Memphis, but I think Memphis has the potential, uh, once again, to be, uh, you know, we used to get city beautiful. We used to get, you know, all of these accolades. Uh, I think we're listed as number one uh, as the most violent city in the nation per capita. We are already at this point, uh, the most number of homicides that were committed in the city of Memphis was 332. Uh, somebody said 334 the other day, but it was known as 332. And that was set last year. Prior to that, the number was 228, which was set in 2016. Prior to that, it had been nowhere near that. But if you look from 2016, from 228 to uh, 2020, uh, which was 334, that's an increase of over 100 homicides in one year. And we come back the next year, 2021, and we've already broken that record of 330, 334, 332. So we're still on an upward climb when it comes to the homicides in this city. I think, uh, I think some things got out of hand. Uh, I think a lot of the I'm not going to say the crime was uh, was intentional. I don't think that. But I do think when you look at, we talked about those project areas and all of that, which was prime real estate. I think there was some mechanism put in place to be able to get those individuals out of those areas to decentralize that crime. I also think that uh, there are mechanisms in place that allow poverty. I think we have like a 27% poverty rate. That is high. Uh, for any city. Uh, in this city, when you have so much industry, we got, we're like the warehouse capital, we're the transportation hub, it's just so much. But uh, Tennessee being what they call a right to work state, you can't have unions either. So they've kept the, um, uh, the income low in this city. And especially for those individuals that are uneducated, those individuals that uh, are coming out of those projects and different things like that. So I think, you know, I, I, I'm a, I was an Intel analyst in the army. So I like to deep think things and not just look at the surface. And I think a lot of the blight was manufactured. I think a lot of things were manufactured, but I think it got out of hand because there are those that probably thought it would never touch me and it wouldn't come into my community, but guess what it has. Uh, and it's gotten out of hand. Now you got everybody, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, um, you know, I'm a firm believer that we got to sure up the families in this city uh, because a lot of this stuff starts at home and you, everybody can't fix it. And then we got to have individuals that are trying to fix it that know what the problems are. You got all of these people in these high places, the mayor and uh, all of these uh, socialites and intellects that's trying to fix problems that are going on down here with killers and robbers and you, no, you, you can't do it. You have to understand uh, 
why some of these things are being done. You got young people out in these communities now that are going, growing up with post-traumatic stress disorder. They're seeing people killed all around them. They're seeing people uh, being harmed. You know, we may have had 332 plus homicides, but that's not even talking about all of the people that have gotten shot, uh, you know, in this city. And we have one of the best trauma centers in the world, uh, Regional One, which saves a lot of lives. But anyway, so you also have to change the laws in this city or in the state of Tennessee. Uh, because I'm a firm believer. I don't believe in just locking people up, locking them up, locking them up. But I also, uh, and I don't, I, have not, I don't have a problem with people making mistakes. But when it becomes a habit, I have a problem. And I think you, <laughs> you do the crime, you pay the time. Uh, that's just me, Mike Williams, personally. I want to give everybody an opportunity. But somebody got to stand up and say enough is enough. And you have to allow the police to be the police. Uh, but at the same time, I would sit the police down and I said, look, you're going to be held accountable. Don't go out here misusing people. Don't be abusing people. Don't be talking crazy to people. Don't be uh, racially profiling. Don't be uh, all of those good things. I think I think you have to have a dual path. You know, everybody want to go either we need to lock them up and throw away the key and just don't worry about these people. And we, we need more police. We need more police. But you also need to put mechanisms in place. You know, I'm a little upset because I look at a lot of the federal monies that's coming into the city and nobody, nobody, a lot of the grassroots uh, nonprofits that are already working in the community, that money never gets down to them. You know, it never gets there. And they're already doing good things in the community, whereas you got these big umbrella nonprofits in the city that's... Uh, <laughs> that's operated by uh, people that uh, are affluent in the city. And those monies are redirected and reguided to a lot of places. Um, that money could be doing a lot of good if in fact we allow some of these individuals, give them the training. Then you got organizations that are coming into the, uh, into the uh, inner city and they're um, gathering and gleaning all of the data to be able to go out and get these grants that never make it back into the community, but they're using the information of all of the things that are happening in the community. I think the, the politicians, the pastors, uh, the activists, the um, political leaders, and the parents, Somebody has have to bring them all together to be able to fix the issues and the woes in the city of Memphis. And I believe that it can be done. Yeah, I I hear some people say there's a sense of defeatism in Memphis. I'm not hearing that from you right now, but it, it, it seems like some people have felt like, you know what, like it's it's so bad. We can't turn it around. What are we going to do? Throw up their hands. Do you get a sense of that from people that I are think a lot of people, I think a lot of people are just tired. You know what I mean? I get tired. Everybody gets tired. You know, you've got uh, COVID-19. You've got uh, a lot of loved ones that we're losing all along the way. We have individuals that have been being affected by illnesses, uh, other terminal illnesses. We've got uh, individuals that are living in poverty. A lot of people have lost their jobs, you know, um, a lot of people are just frustrated and tired and hopefully they'll find something that's going to allow them the ability to be able to continue. A lot of people are giving up and it's not just here in the city of Memphis because we're talking about the city of Memphis, but we're starting to see this all over the country and especially in a lot of uh, the major metropolis in the city. When you talk about Chicago, when you talk about Detroit, when you talk about New York, when you talk about Philadelphia, when you talk about uh, Houston and, and some of these other places where you have a large population, you know, ours is, is, is really, really, really bad. But this is not just unique to the city of Memphis anymore, uh, even though per capita, because some of the numbers are a lot higher in some of those other cities. When you look at Chicago, you know, I think they had like seven, 800 homicides last year, but they also have millions of people. So uh, when you start looking at per capita, it, definitely looks like, you know, we're, um, we're in a bad way. 
But it's, you know, with everything that's going on, you know, you got people that are being affected in your family, my family. Uh, we're seeing children uh, that, you know, are committing a lot of heinous crimes uh, right now because we've had 13-year-olds, we've had 12-year-olds that are actually the killers or the shooters uh, uh, in the city of Memphis. Uh, but it also is a reflection of how we've allowed uh, the city for such a long time and we've neglected a lot of these issues. And one of the things that I always tell people is first you have to admit you have a problem because for some reason, every time I would say here in the city of Memphis, we got a problem. Uh, they'd be like, Michael, why are you so negative? Uh, because I'm a realist, maybe. And I can see what the hell is going on. Uh, and I'm not afraid to admit that we have a problem because it's almost like, you know, uh, an alcoholic. You can't really address the true underlying issues until, first of all, you admit you have a problem, and then you start to dissect uh, that problem and try to come to, uh, with some resolve. Yeah. Well, hey, man, I, Memphis needs your your wisdom and your insights and your um, intelligence and all that to, you know, so hopefully, you know, you continue to push for change, man. I know you started the nonprofit. You have at least one of them, right? The, the one, um, the... Um, Humble Hearts Foundation, was that you that set that up to get kids yeah. off the streets a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I started that when I got back from the Army. When yeah. I initially came back to Memphis about 20 years ago. Yeah. Wait, I mean, cities like the one that you're that you're in, they're going through troubles, man. They just need as many Mike Williams as they can find as they can get to help, you know, get things you know, around and you know. You know, we as a whole, man, we gotta stop saying it's gotta be either this way. Or that way, you know, it's like I deal with some of these young activists and because I'm the police or I used to be the police, they wouldn't want to talk to me. But, you know, like I used to tell them in 1967, 68, I marched in Main Street uh, with Dr. Martin Luther King. I was a child, but my father made sure that we were involved. Uh, so I know activism. Uh, I was there at Mason Temple when he gave that last speech. Uh, because of my father, and I was a child, but I was in awe uh, of everything that was just going on. And to be here, you know, 50 some years later, uh, and to see what has become of all of those efforts, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like uh, it's surreal, and it's hell damn near embarrassing, because uh, the strides that were being made and, you know, it's like we took uh, three steps forward, but it's like we didn't took 30 steps backwards uh, and not even in relations to the racism or the races. I'm just talking about social economic uh, justice or social economic uh, parity, you know, and it's I'm a firm believer that, you know, nobody does anything to you. You, you allow people to do things to you or you relegate yourself to the fact that you can't. Well, I was always taught that you could. And a lot of the things, even since I've been back in the city of Memphis, a lot of people tell me I can't do them. But for some reason, we always achieve it. But it's because you don't give up and you continue to press forward. So, um It's just everywhere. Hey guys, if you learned something new about America or what it's like to live in America, great! you should think about subscribing and turning on your notifications. You can also click one of these videos or playlists for more. You can also now buy my songs on iTunes and other formats. Click the link in the description. Thanks for watching. And remember, while we all might have different views, 
We should all be nice to each other and try to make the U.S. a better place in a positive way. This is Sage Nick's manager. This has been a Corner House Entertainment production. And are you looking to move and need advice? I do consulting. That's right. I'll sit down and talk about where the next perfect place for you and your family should be. I do it all the time. Together, let's find you a new home that's safe and checks all your boxes. You can get my email in the description to find out how I can help you find your perfect relocation. And I can also help you find your new house too. Email me and I'll work with you on not just helping you figure out where to move, but I can help you find your perfect home too. That's right, someone's a realtor now. Who wants to deal with a realtor they don't know when you can have me help you, right?